In conversation with Mary Claire Norton, Mary Claire Norton has been interested in writing fiction, especially fantasy short stories since high school. She is a published poet in a national treasure of poems anthology and wrote and directed a short play based on The Crucible, which was performed in a high school. M. Norton is a longtime fantasy fiction fan and has especially been influenced by authors as J.R.R. Tolkien, Anne McCaffrey, and Morgan Llewellyn. After startling Celtic and Norse pre Christian cultures for many years, she has used that knowledge in her tales of Alandia novels. M. Norton is now retired and lives with her husband and cat in the Salt Lake Valley, Utah. Tarak's Journey is a first of a planned trilogy called Takes of Elendia. Tarak's story will continue in the Master, Livingstone, and the Ruling Clowns. And on today's episode of Auto Interview, it's my utmost pleasure and joy to have on the show today, Mary Claire Norton. How are you doing, Mary? Well, a little bit nervous doing a live interview, but... <laughs> Okay, on the whole, I'd say. Yeah, it's so lovely, actually, to have you on the show today. Quite exciting. We're going to be having a conversation around your works. I do want to point out, uh, and don't take this wrong, most people, a lot of people do this, but mm -hmm. it's Celtic, like it was K-E-L-T-I-C. Oh. Celtic is the name of the culture. Celtics are a basketball team in the United States. Oh, <laughs> It's the ball. It's the Boston Celtics um, basketball oh. team. It's the Celtic culture. Oh, interesting! Celtic sounds amazing. Thank yeah. you. So, actually, in a little bit more on that, Keltoi is a Greek name given to those people, mm. and they took that as their own. So they were the Celts and wow. are. Or the Celts, but it came originally from from Greek, which is spelled with a K, K E L T O I, nice. oh. Keltoi. Oh, interesting. That's a lovely background into that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'd love to ask you: Could you tell us about a book, Tara's Journey, which I found the description page of it on Amazon to be quite awesome? And captivating, being a fact that you know it's a Fox book in the tale of Helendia trilogy. I love to ask you, how does this book come about? What inspired you to write Tarak's journey? Well, Tara's journey has been a journey. Mm. <laughs> Tara's journey started out many, many years ago, Ooh. and I do mean many, many years ago. Um, before I was married with my now husband. We did a role playing and mm. in that role playing, I was Tara. He was Alaric wow. and it had originally been based on the idea of the Norse and Vic uh, sorry, the Norse and Irish cultures in about 800 AD mm. when the Vikings were raiding Ireland all the time. Ooh. It was supposed to be a historical novel. But being new, we wrote the story first, and then I did my research only to find out that that's not at all what could have happened ever in wow. that time period. So I said, oh, okay, I know how to fix this. We'll turn this into a fantasy mm. in another world, and therefore I don't have to worry about anything being historically accurate. Wow. So the story got rewritten a couple more times. Wow. Uh, an earlier iteration of the book is called the book of Tara. Mm -hmm. um, but Tara's journey is the finished product, as it were, um, a much better, better flow of the story, um, more detail, more just, just a better, just a better book. That's amazing. And so that's, that's, that's the one that has truly started the trilogy. That's amazing. And if you have a copy of it there, could you show it to the camera just so we can Do. see what it looks like? Um, I hope you can see it. Oh, again. That's such an amazing cover too. Is that Tara in front of the cover? Is that a character 
Like it's another character? That is, well, that's the uh, caricature of Tara. And it's, oh. with a, it's with a soft A. Tara. That's the Celtic pronunciation. Oh. Tara is actually the Hindi pronunciation. Oh. oh. Yeah, and I think it's Sant Edi, even. Yeah, the word Tara. Yeah. Well, Tara, the hill of Tara is an actual place in Ireland. Oh. It was the place wow. of the ancient kings. Wow. And, and it actually exists, and I've actually been there. Oh, that's quite amazing to know, really. Thank you for sharing. I enjoy listening to this. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, for readers who haven't read Tara's journey yet, and without giving much information away, could we have a sneak? Of what we'd expect in terms of teams picking up the book? I would say the biggest thing is ta how Tara's character develops throughout the book. Mm -hmm. She starts out as this um, young princess, uh, daughter of a minor lord in Irlandia. And while her husband and older brother are away, she is, uh, her town that she's visiting is beset by Viking raiders and she's kidnapped. Oh. Um, and then it's the whole journey to the kidnappers home, which is Vicland. Mm. And during that time, she discovers many things. She discovers her mother's Liffenstone mm. is actually a whole lot more than just a pretty piece of jewelry. And she finds out that an ancient enemy that she thought long destroyed is alive and well and plotting against her country. Wow. Wow. And all of this actually takes place spanning two different periods of time. One is present day where Mav, who discovers the journal of Tara, mm -hmm. she's from what we would consider our modern day. And then Tara herself, Tara Prima, the first Tara, mm. had takes place several hundred years earlier. As Mav reads the journal, she becomes embroiled in the story. And so some of the narration is third person and some is first. Mm. Well, this is such an amazing one, actually. I enjoy you talking about it. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> sharing. Thank you. And, you know, apart from Tarak's journey, do you have any of the works you've altered or, say, currently working on? Well, I just finished the first draft of the manuscript for the second of the series. Interesting. The Master of Stone. Right. Uh, and uh, I don't have any other published works besides that. We're 20 years old at this point. Oh, that's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in case it's not obvious, I, I, I've i seen more than a few trips around the sun. Oh. Do you have a particular timeline for, you know, shedding for the publication of the second series? Or you're just going alongside with it, with your time? Not yet. Oh, interesting. Like I said, the, the rough manuscript is done. I have to do all the, um, being a former English, not exactly Teacher. a major, but English was one of my things that I love to study. Yeah. Uh, I'll do my own Edit. proofreading oh. and my own minor editing mm. before I figure out who I want to publish it or how I want to publish it. Interesting. So yeah. I'm hoping sometime in 2025, but probably not before that. Yeah, that's lovely. That's great, even. Yeah, it's even amazing to know you have other works. Another series following through it. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's got a lot of work, actually, we got going. Hopefully you find some time to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not exactly slaving away at my computer all day. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is quite fun. <laughs> thank you for your answer. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I've always been fascinated and surprised and taken aback about how writers, especially novelists like yourself, craft long sentences and bring words together in a way that it eventually makes a great novel. And this always leaves me thinking, how exactly 
they got the ideas to pull this words together. I mean, you have a paragraph, making pages, making chapters, quite a lot of chapters, and an eventual lovely book afterward. So this always leaves me thinking, oh, they got the ideas to pull these things together. And as far as writing is concerned, I'd love to ask you too. How do you get your inspirations and ideas? Where did they come from? Whenever people ask me this question, I'm always a little hesitant to answer because I probably don't have what one would consider a typical writing. How I write, how I write is probably not the way most people write. I'll put mm. it that way. Mm. I have inner prompts. I call it my muse. Mm. And it's always been like this from high school when I started writing poetry and short stories, I will get this sudden idea in my head and I have to go write it down mm. right then and there, uh, or at least jot down the gist of it. And then when I start writing, it just flows as if it's someone else that's, that's writing through me wow. or something else. Mm. And, and it just comes and comes and comes and comes and comes until it sort of reaches a natural conclusion to that that bit of of the story or that bit of the writing or the mm. poem is is finished or whatever. Mm. And then I sit there and reread and go, oh, okay. Well, then if this happened, then that's got to happen. Mm. So I know what my next section will be. Mm. But I, I know that's probably not true for most writers. Absolutely. You know, most writers sit down and they, they figure, I, I have a general plot in my head. Mm. I know what needs to happen. Mm. But as far mm. as how it happens and when it happens and why it happens, that all just comes down through from wherever, through my fingers to the top, to the, <laughs> to the typewriter. I was about to say, cause that's what I started writing on mm. <laughs> to this, you know, to, to the keyboard and yeah. Well, that's such a dynamic way of writing. That is quite commendable and quite exceptional too. I know it's not usual. <laughs> <laughs> then again, I'm not usual in a lot of ways. So mm. <laughs> it, it only fits. <laughs> oh, wow. That's quite amazing, really. I mean, it's quite lovely to hear your take on this. And I've had quite a lot of people this question and so I would say, uh, I get my ideas from the dreams, from my dreams. I get my ideas from, you know, real life experience with a blend of fiction. I get my ideas from what I've seen around me, from, you know, the things around. I get an idea from the story of my friend or his family or, you know, some different places. So it's quite exceptional how different people get to know all the ideas and inspiration comes from. And yeah, some come in a dynamic, quite exceptional that sometimes it might be even difficult for the authors to see particularly where these ideas are coming from. Like it's entirely yeah. strange to me. I have no idea where they're coming from, you know, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think a lot of my, my backgrounds are, my world building comes from years and years and years of study of Celt pre-Christian Celtic and Norse cultures. Mm -hmm. And that's very obvious in my books. Right, it's yeah. obvious from the names that I use. Oh. Uh, and I combine that, like I said, with the original role-playing game that I did mm -hmm. with my husband, as far as the core story about Alaric and Tara. But then I expanded that to mm -hmm. make it, world building and you've got Maeve and you've got these other Dre, otherwise what people would call Druid or mm. Druids. You've got um, characters from out of Celtic myth mm. and uh, folklore, uh, oh. things like that. Oh. But so I take all of that accumulated knowledge, which is decades long, literally decades long and mm. I put that in to the mix of of the story and, and that way I can expand it. And that way I have, here's this world, which in some ways actually did and does exist, mm. but in other ways there's other elements to it, like a lot of magical elements wow. that aren't in real life, wow. but it helps to enrich the story. Wow. This is beautiful. I enjoy hearing you talk about this. 
beautiful and also educative. Thank you, Mary. Uh-huh. Love it. Thank you. And, you know, let's talk about feedbacks and criticism, you know. As authors, we all have different ways of reacting to feedbacks and criticism, both positive and negative. And I think that's not how far one goes in writing. There will always be criticism. There will always be that person that would say, oh, this is horrible. This is not good enough. This is not my type, etc." And, you know, I'm just curious to know your opinion about criticism. How do you react to negative reviews of your books if case have ever had one in time past um well i actually just had had a friend tell me with my book number one it's not her favorite genre it's not one she reads often but she did because we're friends and she had trouble with the names oh. and um, it's like, okay, so I was making a mental note to myself to maybe put down a pronunciation guide at the back of the book. Oh, at the back that's... of my next book, anyway. How exactly are you supposed to pronounce these names? Now, when I'm reading, I just come up with my own pronunciation and I leave it at that. Mm. You know, uh, and if the book ever eventually turns into a, a movie, yeah, and in whatever way they pronounce the names is how I then end up pronouncing it. Mm. Uh, Take, for example, Hermione from the Harry Potter books. You look at that name, and if there's a whole bunch of ways you could pronounce that name, the way it's spelled. You know, Hermione, Hermione, uh, Herman, A. I mean, there's just different ways. Yeah. And, uh, of course, now I've seen the movies, and now it's Hermione in my head. Oh. But I don't even remember what I had decided it was when I was reading the book. <laughs> but it wasn't Hermione. <laughs> and you had to go with but that I because you edit it in the TV. Yeah, it's like, I, I, I really don't care. I will name my characters or the characters in the book. Mm. If I end up finding out, oh, well, actually, it's supposed to be this way. Then I was like, okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's quite um, lovely. But I don't, yeah. If, to me, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Absolutely. And I don't take criticism personally mm. at all. It's not an attack on me. Mm. Someone doesn't like what I write. I look at, okay, why? And if it's something that makes sense, like my friend, it's like, okay, I can see that. Because she's not the only person that said they've they had trouble with the names or some of the other things it's like okay i need to educate the reader Mm. a little bit more i need to help them out Mm. so in my next book i will probably be adding a glossary with a bunch of of names and how to pronounce them as well as who or what they are yeah that's a good one too yeah that's a good one and i'd also like to ask you could you tell us what publishing is like for a published author like yourself Are there any challenges you've encountered in the process of writing your book and also ever since it got published? My biggest problems are getting the word out so as to so that people know the book exists and hopefully will start buying Mm. it. Because honestly, to be honest, my sales are dismal (laughs) right (laughs) now. And, you know, I've... um, I'm hybrid published through HarperCollins. Wow. They did an excellent job of, of putting the book together. There's, they're the ones who designed the front cover. It wasn't me. Wow. Wow. Um, but they don't help at all with publicity. Uh, they don't help with promoting. And being retired as I am and not a lot of extra money to spend on non-essentials, which as much as people might like to believe mm-hmm. getting my book out there is not essential. Keeping my roof over my head and food on the table. That's essential. It's essential. <laughs> I didn't need yeah. that in order to write the books, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would say just, you know, being, being able to get people to take the time to my book is free on Amazon KU. Wow. Um, so if someone has KU, they can go in there and, and read it for free. Wow. So, um, 
but even that I very, very little. And it's just because I'm not known. I'm sure this is my first book. Mm. I haven't been around. I haven't done things in the past that have been published. Mm. I'm hoping when the second book comes out, people will at least say, Oh yeah, I know that name and go back and hopefully read both of them. Mm. Um, but I, w- I would say just, just that being able to, as a person who doesn't have extra, a lot of extra money to spend, finding ways to get the word out without having to spend a ton of money mm. that I don't have. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's a general issue that I think in, in the writing world, and I hope that this interview actually helps to get your book and name out there beat sensor in in a way it's it can go that'll be fine yeah yeah i would i'm i'm hopeful that maybe your your viewers will decide to to take a gander at tara's journey and and uh you know whether they read it on ku or whether they, yeah, they Kingdom Limited, i think you know i'm also on barnes and noble i'm also on ingram spark oh interesting so um you know i have those those three be three biggies, and I think there's more around. I'm just don't know who they are off the top of my head. Oh, <laughs> I have Thank enough you. trouble just advertising the, the big three, much less what other what Amazon, other ones. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Grand Spark. Yeah, I think these are the three yeah. big actually. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Grand Spark. Yeah, and all this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning. Now, let's let's hear your advice. You know, as a published author, what sort of advice do you have for writers who are still struggling with writing and publishing a book? What would you advise people in this category? Don't give up. Don't give up. Um, it may take you, I mean, it took me literally decades to go from wow. my original story that I had in my head, writing that one down. And then it just got set aside for years, taking in the original manuscript, which was typewritten on a regular typewriter with regular paper disappeared. Wow. It got lost. And so I had to recreate what I remembered. And, but then that gave me the liberty to sit there and go, okay, I want to throw in some other elements. What can I do? And so I had the gist of the love, basically love story between Tara and Alaric. And then I created all this other stuff around that, that core story and, and turned it into this trilogy that it's now birthed into. So I would say, however long the road takes, it's worth it. Wow. And yeah, you're going to, you're going to cry. You're going to get mad. You're going to want to chuck the computer out the window because things aren't going your way. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it will be worth it in the end. That's, that's, you know, now I get the fun part of going to local bookstores and doing book signings and talking with the people who have bought my book and being the outgoing person that I am, it's amazingly fun for me. Yeah, you know, I don't know, but I think I've heard this over and over again. I don't think there's any writer who hasn't lost his own manuscript before in the past. Either you lost it to a crushed laptop, or you lost it to an editor who is careless about it, or you lost it in one way or the other, or your phone crashed. I mean, I've heard so many stories of Someone telling me, oh, I wrote so of things, but I lost it. I'm like, oh, wow, that's quite sad. You know, knowing that writing those things initially isn't an easy task. I mean, writing is not an easy task generally, though it's fun. But it's not an easy task. And there are some words that you write the first time. It might be a bit difficult for you to write it again the second time. So I don't know. It, it's more like a common or more like a general experience, I'll say, for most writers to lock their manuscripts. I don't know why. Even, even the famous authors, most of them have lost their manuscript in time past and they have to rewrite and get going. More like it's a general obstacle 
I don't know if I'll call it a general <laughs> obstacle for all writers to experience. I, I just don't know why. Yeah, I yeah, you hear you hear stories, but I will tell you for me, for my personal yeah. experience. I'm almost glad the original original was lost because hmm. I kept the gist and I didn't feel like I had to go with all of the things that happened the first time. I was able to create a better world, a bigger world, a more interesting world the second time around. Hmm. And I think that might be true for a lot of authors. Yeah. Um, once you write something, whether you realize it or not, it's it's still here. Yeah, everything, it's in the brain. Everything yeah. we do, wow. everything we think, it's never lost. It's in here. So they mm. may lose that actual manuscript or part of a manuscript or whatever the case may be. But when they go back, the mind remembers what's important. Mm. They can retake. They can they they can go back and say, "Oh yeah." Hmm. This idea, oh, oh yeah, that conversation, or oh yeah, that description of that particular thing or that particular place, hmm. and they'll use that. But then they build new stuff around it. Hmm. And wow. most of the time, a revised story, a story that's rewritten either from scratch or parts of is better hmm. than the original. In the region. I'm taking some notes here. I think I love to make, <laughs> yeah, I think I love to make, as you're sticking, I'm taking some notes using my right hand to type. I think I love to make a video around this topic separately. I mean, I've had so many stories. I particularly, personally, I've lost some stories in the past that even got me crying. Like, oh my God, why? What happened? I took my laptop to an engineer, told him, can anything be done to, re to retrieve the file? I mean, it's a bunch, very long file. I mean, I've got it to uh -huh. chapter 10 for crying out loud. Please, nothing can be done. I had to leave the place, went to another person. I was like, no, I went on YouTube, such a lot of videos. How can I retrieve my doc file from a crashed laptop? <laughs> it, was so, it was such a bunch of, you know, very sad, actually. And I agree with you. I think, I think it gives you the idea to kind of write better or write them more. So I don't know why we often, recently I was talking with a friend and she told me how someone next lost her file, an editor to be mistakenly displays it and how it how it left her to be so sad. I mean, that's a bunch of our works being thrown away in the dust, blah, blah, blah. So it's, yeah, I think it's something worth discussing, really. You've got, you've got to remember way back when, and you're too, probably too young to even really remember this, but a lot of the original, you know, the big writers, the famous named writers, Tolkien, and yeah. now the names are escaping me. But in any yeah. case, they would they would write stuff. They'd reread it. They hated it. They'd crumple up the paper and throw it away. <laughs> Losing a file from Whoa. the internet or from, the, from your computer is the modern version of taking the piece of paper, crumpling it up, mm, and throwing and it away. It away. Imagine. You know, now, it may not be, in some cases, it's not you could do that on purpose mm, mm, but yeah you know but there's always that but then they would go on and they would take another tact or they still had they still knew the gist of what they wanted to write but mm. not having the old version in front of their head allowed their imagination to then take a dif different path wow. take that left instead of the right whatever the case might be and I think I think that's how all great writing happens. You take hmm. the path less traveled. Wow. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this discussion. This is quite lovely. I enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then before we wrap it up, is there anything that you'd love to share with the viewers about your book that we did not mention in this interview? And you'd love the viewers to do. And also, where can interested viewers get a copy of the book? Okay. Um, the last thing I will say is if there are readers out there, fantasy readers who happen to know a bit about Celtic history, Irish history, uh, or Norse history, mm. 
I have sprinkled that book with what I call literary Easter eggs, where they will know exactly who I'm talking about or where I'm talking about. So they get a little extra jump and it's, it's Mm. not, doesn't take away from if someone knows absolutely nothing about ancient Irish history, that doesn't matter. But if Mm. someone happens to, they'll go, Oh, okay. This name is disguised, but I know who you're talking about Mm. or I know where you're talking about. Uh. And it just adds a little bit of another dimension to the story. I think. Mm. As far as where it's available, as I mentioned earlier, you can get it through Amazon. It's available both ebook and paperback. Barnes and Noble has ebook or paperback. And Ingram Spark is just paperback. Wow. That's great. That's amazing. Thank you, Mary. And I left a link in the description part of this interview where interested viewers can get a copy of Marie Claire Norton's books directly on Amazon and also on other platforms. So thank you so much, Mary, for accepting the invitation to be featured on P English Literature. It's lovely having this conversation with you. Well, thank you for having me. It it was it was fun. <laughs> it was so fun. As I said, the Master Livingstone, I'm hoping for some time in 2025. Yeah. And I haven't even started the third book. In fact, I, I, I've discarded the original title, so now I have to come up with a new title. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a dynamic switch. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. This was so fun. I enjoyed it.